as you can see from there, um, he is a faculty, uh, tenured faculty uh, at the Jerusalem College of Technology. His area of research is entrepreneurship and tied into economic concepts, uh, done a lot of stuff on creativity, associated also with some of the the roles that the military and some other kind of like um, environmental factors associated with the Israeli economy and how it actually that drives innovation. Um, he's had some, this is not his first rodeo at the College of Charleston, uh, which is exciting. Uh, so we're very appreciative of him taking the time to drive from Florida. Uh, he said he actually enjoyed, he's got six kids, no, yeah, six. six. Yeah. So, uh, you know, having a ride, from Florida to here by himself was kind of like the ultimate luxury. Uh, you know, I had a lot of uh, personal thinking to do. So, uh, without any further ado, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. So, uh, so, thank you very much to David and Renee and Josh and everybody else who played a role in hosting me and hosting this lecture. I appreciate it, and it's always a pleasure to come to Charleston. Uh, so I entitled my talk from Oranges to, or to Orcam. I'll talk about later on in the lecture why that's the title of the lecture. But you'll notice that the lecture is subtitled, The Evolution of Israel's Economy. The Evolution of Israel's Economy, it's about a 100-year story. And to tell the story of Israel's economy, I'd like to start with another story, and that's a Talmudic story. A little over 2,000 years ago, there was a debate between two rabbis of the Talmud, between Hillel and Shammai. And a potential convert came to Shammai, and he said, you know, I'm interested in converting, but before I do, I want you to tell me everything there is to know about the Torah, about Judaism, why you stand on one foot. In other words, boil it down to a couple sentences. So Shammai, taking the approach that he took, said, get out of here, you're not serious. So he goes to Shammai's counterpart and ideological nemesis, Hillel, and he says, teach me the entire Torah while standing on one foot. So he does. So that's exactly what I'm going to try and do. I'm going to try and teach you 100 years of Israel's economy while standing on one foot. We'll see if I'm able to stand up to the challenge. By the way, what does Hillel say to this potential convert who wants him to teach the entire Torah, all of Judaism while standing on one foot, he says, that which is hateful to you, do not do unto others. The rest is commentary. Now go and learn. So we're going to go and learn. Where will I get started? Before I talk about Israel, I'd like to talk about the stages of the development of an economy. There are different ways of describing a country's economic development. Once upon a time, we used to talk about first world countries and third world countries. We talk about developed countries and developed English countries. But one of the paradigms I'd like to use is factor-driven economies, efficiency-driven economies, and innovation-driven economies. So if we think of, how do we put it, primitive countries, and that might not be politically correct to say nowadays, but if we look at countries with primitive economies, they're oftentimes factor-based. That means they might export extractive products, lumber, fish, petroleum, and so forth. As the economies develop, they become what's called efficiency-driven economies. And efficiency-driven economies are the economies that we can think of, and I'm going to give you a few examples momentarily, are economies that we think of as cheap sources of manufactured goods. So we like to talk about China, there are several other countries, and what China and those other countries generally have to offer the world is efficiency. In other words, they can manufacture iPhones at a lower cost than the United States can manufacture iPhones. Therefore, Apple, which is an American company, manufactures its iPhones in China rather than in the United States. So those are efficiency-driven countries. The most developed form of economy, according to the World Economic Forum, is what's called innovation-driven economies. Innovation-driven economies are countries like the United States, much of Western Europe, Israel, and several other countries that, were, that we perceive to be modern countries. Now, I want to couch the talk within this framework because what I'm going to hint at during the talk is the development of Israel's economy from extractive and agricultural industries 
through efficiency-driven industries. And finally, we like to talk about the startup nation and so forth. Well, we're going to get into the final section of the talk, and we'll talk about Israel's innovation-driven economy. Let's go on. Peter Drucker. Some of you might be familiar with the name Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker was perhaps a management guru. He wrote 39 books about management. He had lots of fascinating things to say. In fact, if this were a talk on Jewish history, and by the way, I am not a historian, but if this were a talk on Jewish history, I might actually tie Peter Drucker into Jewish history. He was a German Lutheran who immigrated to the United States of Jewish extraction. In 1936, he wrote a very interesting essay in German about the Jewish question in Germany. But again, this is a talk about economics and development, not a talk about Jewish history. So we'll put that aside. But what Peter Drucker said is that if an economy, no, let's put it this way. If you earn your bread by the sweat of your brow, at some point you're going to find yourself unemployed because anything that a man could do, or a human could do, a machine could do better. Now this is very interesting because he said this in 1959. And what was happening in 1959, if we think of the three decades that followed World War II, the U.S. economy was booming. And the U.S. economy was based almost entirely on manufacturing. The automotive industry, the steel industry, several other efficiency-based industries. So Peter Drucker is envisioning a future where if you engage in manufacturing, if you engage in manual labor, at some point in the future, you're likely to find yourself unemployed. Well, that's pretty interesting. And again, I want to use this slide and this reference to couch the talk in terms of factor-driven economies, efficiency-driven economies, and innovation-based economies. Let's go on. Now, I know from where you're sitting, you can't see this. And I know as a presenter, it's a very bad practice to put a slide on the board that the audience can't see. But I will explain what this slide is all about. What this slide is all about <coughs> is the division of countries into extractive or uh, three different levels of economic development, factor, efficiency, and uh, innovation-driven economies, and there are these two in-between classes, which are those countries that are in transition. Once upon a time, it was popular to talk about BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, Ireland, and so forth. Well, some of those countries are less developed, some of those countries are more developed, but none of those countries have reached innovation-based economies status. Um, this relates to some of the other really interesting research that I've done about innovation, but we'll leave that aside. And again, the sole purpose of me presenting this slide is so that you could gain a sort of frame of reference of where countries stand. Russia, China, Brazil, and others. Again, China is in this category over here, an efficiency-based economy. Russia is an efficiency-based economy. In other words, what they have to offer the world is generally lower-cost manufactured goods. Let's go. So, I said I was going to start this talk in 1920, and I'm going to present about 100 years of Israel's economic history. Now, why am I starting in 1920 if Israel didn't become a state until 1948? Is it arbitrary? Well, a couple very important things happened in 1920 that are related to Israel's economy, even though Israel wasn't yet a state. One of the things that happened was the Histadrut Labor Federation was established. I'm going to talk about that later on, not now. But another very important thing that happened in 1920 was that this paper was written by the League of Nations. The League of Nations was this world body that preceded the United Nations. And they speak about the state of the art. They speak about the civil administration of Palestine. Now, to conceptualize or to contextualize these things, if you know your history, the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire, controlled the Middle East for centuries. And in World War I, the United Kingdom, the British Army, defeated the Ottomans. Allenby, the British general, marched into the Jaffa Gate 
There are famous photos of him marching in. The Ottomans surrendered, and that was the end of the Ottoman period in Jerusalem, the, or in his, what was to become Israel. So the Ottoman period ends, and the British period begins. The British period ends in, with the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. But this is very interesting. What do they say? Let's read this again. This is from a League of Nations document. So they talk about Jews being 76,000 people. They were a small minority of the population. There had been Jews throughout history, but in various periods of history, they were either a minority or a right, very small minority, and they only became a majority of the population later on in history. So the League of Nations talks about the Jews that came prior to the 1850s, and what do they say? They're motivated, their religious motives, they came to pray and die in the Holy Land and to be buried in the soil. Once upon a time, for out, throughout the ages, Jews have prayed for the return to Zion and the Holy Land and so forth, but in those days they didn't have political aspirations of establishing a state. They wanted to go to the Holy Land, pray in the Holy Land, be buried in the Holy Land, but they didn't really have political aspirations until a number of years later. So again, this document was written in 1920, after the Zionists, the modern Zionists, who had aspirations to establish a state came, and what did they say? They developed the culture of oranges, they gave importance to the Jaffa orange trade, they cultivated the vine and manufactured and exported wine, they drained swamps and eucalyptus trees, and here's another thing, at the present time there are 64 of the settlements, some of them were kibbutzim, some of them were moshavim, some of them were moshavot, again, this is not a class in modern Zionist, History, so we won't get into the differences, but there were 64 of those settlements, villages, large and small, with a population of 15,000. And what do they say? Every traveler in Palestine who visits them is impressed by the contrast between these pleasant villages and the beautiful stretches of prosperous cultivation about them, the primitive conditions of life and work by which they are surrounded. Well, this is very interesting because <coughs> I want to stress this is not a talk about politics, this is not a talk about Zionism, this is not even a talk about history. I'm not going to talk about Jews versus Arabs or Muslims versus Jews. It's not relevant to this talk. But what I do want to say is that the surrounding Arab populations were largely engaged in subsistence level agriculture. And when the Jews came, particularly the Zionistic Jews, when they came, they sought to develop the economy. So again, arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, I decided to start my talk at this period in history, 1920. So here are a couple of posters advertising the different areas of commerce in which they engaged. We see advertisements for Jaffa oranges, we see an advertisement for tourism, we see advertisement for grapes, and again, that's exactly what the League of Nations spoke about in the previous slide. They spoke about Jaffa oranges, they spoke about the cultivation of the vine, and of course we know that if you have a very small economy and you are reliant upon hard cash and foreign currency, what do you do? You develop an export economy, and this is the very, very early stages of the export economy that they developed. Again, I said I want to avoid political talk, but there are a couple of things that you might notice and you might notice, again, those of you who read Hebrew, you can read this, and in Hebrew, this particular tract of land is referred to as Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and in English, this particular tract of land is referred to as Palestine. Again, we'll leave it for a course in Zionism and history, who are Palestinians, that's something that's an entirely different thing, but you'll notice that here, the Jewish agency is promoting Palestinian tourism, and you'll notice also that the Palestine House in New York is selling exported wine grown by those engaging in agriculture and viticulture in the Holy Land. So, another important thing happened in the 1930s. So we spoke about extractive industries, we spoke about agriculture, in the 1930s, a very interesting thing happened. What happened in the 1930s? Throughout the years, beginning in the late 1800s, there were waves of Jewish immigration to the Holy Land. Well, in the 1930s, there was another wave. It came to be known as the fifth wave of immigration 
to the Holy Land. And this wave of immigration was very, very different from the previous waves of immigration. It was primarily German Jews or Jews from Czechoslovakia, many from Poland, but those who were bourgeois, those who were middle class, those who were educated, and rather than coming to the Holy Land to work the land, they, many of them came to the Holy Land to establish businesses, to establish factories, and they were engaging in the activities that they had engaged in as middle class citizens of Germany. So this was the, uh, really the foundations of the establishment of industry in the Holy Land. Many of the names of the families that came at the time are familiar to us today. Some of you might be familiar with the name Strauss. At the time they established a dairy which would go on to be a dairy which is, uh, uh, they have to be the largest coffee trader in Eastern Europe. In other words, they sort of outgrew business in Israel and they still do business in Israel, but when you're too big for your britches, you expand internationally. The Strauss family, the Schulken family, one of the large publishing families, the Wertheimer family. So all these families from this German bourgeois that came to Israel in the 1930s sort of laid the industrial foundations for the development of the economy in Israel. Now, what's really interesting is that the Nazis came to power. Again, this is not a talk in history, but economy and history are so intertwined that it's really impossible to avoid talking about one without talking about the other. The German Jews, in many senses, were better off than the Jews elsewhere in Europe. We know that the Holocaust occurred, and we're actually going to get there momentarily. But what happened was the German Jews had more of an advanced warning. And when things started getting bad for them, many were able to get up and leave. And it was only too late for the Jews elsewhere to leave, and they were stuck in Europe, really with nowhere to go. So many of the German Jews left, many immigrated to Israel, many also immigrated to North America and South America, elsewhere in the world. But many other Jews were sort of stuck behind. So if we look at history, and we're familiar with our history, the Germans annexed Austria in 1938. The Germans invaded Czechoslovakia in 1939. March 15, 1939, the Germans invaded Czechoslovakia. This telegram was written two days later. And what's so interesting about this telegram is that this telegram had been hidden from historians. It was in some archive in the UK. And let me tell you a little bit about this telegram. This telegram was written by two conflicting or competing Jewish bodies in Poland, and sensing what was to come, they wrote this letter to the Prime Minister of Great Britain, begging him to allow Jews to enter the Holy Land, which at the time was under British control. So what do they write? To the Prime Minister, London, in the darkest and worst, most tragic hours of history and life of Jewry, three and a half million Jews in Poland appeal to His Majesty's government. In other words, they were saying, please allow us to enter the Holy Land, because just like the Nazis annexed Austria, and just like the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia, they're going to invade Poland momentarily, which of course we know was the case. September. We know that was the case. And this letter, this telegram, was sent. Here's the second part of the telegram. Here's the second part of the telegram. Same telegram, two pages. <coughs> the confidence which the Jewish people have placed in England and most sacred hopes of Jewry not to apply a policy up in Palestine which throws the Jewish masses into an abyss of despair. In other words, they're begging. Prime Minister, Chamberlain, please allow us to enter Europe. Now, he doesn't respond. Another thing, again, if we're talking about Jewish history, I would spend a lot of time talking about the two bodies that sent this telegram. And what's so fascinating is that the two bodies that sent this telegram, the United Zionist Organization and the Agudas Israel of Poland, one was a Zionist, roughly. I would call it Zionist anti-religious organization. And the other I would call 
an anti-Zionist religious organization. In other words, these two organizations, which rented, represented Polish Jewry, were pretty much mirror images of each other. And under ordinary terms, they might not be so buddy-buddy with each other, because ideologically and philosophically, they were adversaries. Yet, sensing the impending danger, they got together and said, please allow us to immigrate to Palestine. Well, anyway, they didn't get a response. Well, they did get a response. They didn't get a response. In fact, some say that that telegram was never read and the envelope wasn't opened until about a month ago. Really fascinating that for 80 some odd years, that telegram sat in some archives in London. Well, the Jews did get a response, but it wasn't sent directly to them, and it wasn't a direct response to their request. In 1939, the white paper was issued. And I know this is bad practice because there's small print here, and you can't read that. But in the yellow above, that small print is highlighted. And what does the white paper talk about? The white paper outlines an immigration policy, among other things, to the Holy Land, what was, at the time, mandatory Palestine. In other words, they said, we will allow 15,000 Jews per year to enter for the five years to come, in other words, 75,000 Jews, and we won't allow any more to enter. Historians debate what the rationale was for that decision. Now, they state quite clearly a rationale, but the question is, was that really the rationale, or was there some other darker force that came to play? There were disputes, disagreements, fights, arguments, perhaps even war between the different factions, the Jews, the Arabs, the British Army that controlled the land at the time. And many say that the reason they didn't allow for greater immigration to the Holy Land was that the Arabs threatened them. And the Arabs said to the British government and the British Army at the time, we're going to cause riots and trouble and all kinds of havoc if you allow more Jews to enter. But what's interesting is that the formal explanation that was given up at the top, and it's underlined, if these circumstances, immigration is continued up to the economic absorptive capacity of the country, regardless of all other considerations, a fatal enmity between the two peoples will be perpetuated. What are they saying? Absorptive capacity. This is a fascinating thing. At the time, we're talking 1939, there were one million people living between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Jews, Arabs, Muslims, call them whatever you want, people, human beings. There are about one million people living that tract of land in 1939. And the British were concerned about absorptive capacity. In other words, if we allow, they said, more people to enter the Holy Land, there won't be enough water, there won't be enough agricultural resources, people will die of starvation, and of course, what happens when we have limited resources? People fight over these limited resources, and people are going to battle, and battle, and battle, and battle, and we will have ad infinitum this war between the Jews and the Arabs if we allow more to enter the land. Now, what's so interesting was, in 1939, they were concerned about absorptive capacity when there were one million people there, Today, if you look at the combined Palestinian and Israeli populations between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, we're talking about 15 million people. In other words, the population has grown 15-fold. And we were just talking about water before the beginning of this lecture. And what's so interesting is that now Israel exports water to our neighboring countries. Israel exports energy resources to Egypt and Jordan and various other countries. Israel exports agricultural products. So at the time, the British were concerned about absorptive capacity. The land cannot support more than 1 million people. Now the land supports 15 million people. And not only are there sufficient resources, there are sufficient resources for export to the surrounding countries as well. It's interesting what we know now. If we had known it at the time, and the British had known at the time, if their immigration policy would have been any different. Now remember, let's just take a step back, and I want to remind you about these very, very tragic telegrams that were sent by the leadership of the Jewish community in Poland. There are three and a half million Jews in Poland at the time, and we know what the fate was of 90% of those Jews that were not able to get out before the war. Let's go on. So, <coughs> we're making our way forward. 
1939, let's talk about World War II. World War II was a very paradoxical period in the Holy Land. Why was it paradoxical? Because Jews were being slaughtered in Europe, yet at the time, in what would become Israel, the economy was thriving, which is really interesting. Why was the economy thriving? The economy was thriving because the British Army was situated throughout much of North Africa and the Middle East. They needed supplies. Supply lines were interrupted, so they weren't able to transport goods from Europe or Great Britain to the Middle East. So they were reliant upon local suppliers. So again, war is a terrible thing. That's also going to be a common theme that runs throughout this talk. War is a terrible thing, yet war oftentimes brings about economic success. So anyway, World War II, um, the Jewish factories production increased. The British needed supplies, machinery, tools, car parts, medical devices, and so forth. But again, we talked about efficiency-based economies. We're not yet going to talk about innovation-based economies, but you'll notice something that's very important here. Hebrew University and the other Jewish institutions provided scientific knowledge and better products, more efficient use of local raw materials, both to the British military and the Jewish-owned factories. In other words, we cannot achieve an innovation-based economy unless we have academic institutions that create that knowledge. So not only did Israeli industry or Jewish industry thrive during World War II, the seeds of an innovation-based economy were planted. Now, they were planted a little bit earlier, but they thrived at the time because there was a need for this knowledge, so the knowledge was developed. In 1948, the state was established. In 1947, in November, a day that's observed and celebrated to this day, November 28th, or it was actually November 29th in Israel because it was after midnight, but in the United Nations, in New York, the partition, the partition, partition plan was approved, and the United Nations voted in favor of the establishment of State of Israel and a state for the Arabs. That was the plan. It never really materialized, but that was the foundation for the establishment of the State of Israel, which would come several months later. Now, you declare a state. Fortunately, the groundwork for the state had been established earlier. So I talked about the establishment of the later Labor Federation, the Hesedrut in 1920. But over the years, universities were established, hospitals were established, infrastructure was built. So essentially, for Israel to go from a non-entity to a political entity was really just a formality because all the foundations of the state existed. But the minute the state became a state, it was presented with lots and lots of challenges. It was presented with the challenge of war as attacked by its neighboring states. It was challenged with absorbing new immigrants. All these new immigrants, and we'll talk about them momentarily, who came from whether survivors of the Holocaust, or whether they came from North Africa and the Middle East, they were all poor, they were all uneducated, they needed to be clothed and housed and fed and educated. So those are some of the challenges that the country was presented with the minute it became a country. So 1948 through the 1950s are what's known in modern Israeli economic history as the austerity period. In Hebrew, they use the word sena, austerity. Now, what was the challenge? The challenge at the time was, <clears throat> excuse me, absorbing new immigrants. We talk about the immigrant problem in the, United, in the United States. We talk about the immigrant problem in Europe. The immigrant problem in Israel was far more severe on a per capita basis. In other words, 700,000 people, that was the population of the country at the time, over a two-year period had to absorb 700,000 immigrants. Essentially what that means is every single person must share his food, his shoes, his housing, with an immigrant. And those numbers are phenomenal numbers. You can imagine what absorbing such a large population has to do, or the effect it has, on the existing resident population. The 
question is, what do you do? How do you survive? How do 700,000 citizens absorb 700, 700,000 immigrants? So Israel is a poor country. Not only is Israel a poor country, Israel is a, uh, a struggling country, suffering, staggering under the weight of the cost of absorbing all these immigrants. So they enacted this austerity plan. And what was this austerity plan? This austerity plan was, take a look at this picture. This picture is the diet of a couple of adults for a week. Can you live on that? 1,600 calories were the daily rations. One was expected to live on 1,600 calories per day. There was very little meat in the diet. There was very little protein in the diet. That's what people lived on. And what's interesting now is to look at the cookbooks of those days and to see how people were able to cook and live and make a diverse menu based on this very, very limited range of raw ingredients. Another interesting thing to look at is this poster. I'll translate some of the important points of the poster. And what the poster talks about is distribution points of the rationed food. In other words, every person received the ration card. You'd go to these stations where the food was distributed, and you'd get your three eggs or your flour or whatever it is. But if you notice, it says here three Turkish eggs. Why did they get Turkish eggs? What's so interesting is that the demand for eggs, pretty cheap source of protein, exceeded the domestic supply of eggs. So where do you get eggs from? It's hard to import eggs. You get eggs from Turkey. One, because Turkey happens to be close by, but the real reason for the importation of Turkish eggs was because the Turkish were willing to engage in barter. The nascent country didn't have hard cash to purchase imports, so they purchased the Turkish eggs with the exportation of Jaffa oranges. It's the oranges for eggs deal. Very, very interesting. Now, a couple other important things that happened at the time were there was great hesitation to accept German reparations for the tragedy of the Holocaust. And there ma there's major political infighting within the different political factions in Israel. Should we accept it? Should we not accept it? Is it a German admission of guilt? Is it a way for the Germans to cleanse their conscience? Anyway, it's necessary to eat. So they decided, OK, we're going to accept German reparations. Not only did they accept German reparations, they accepted US aid, and they actually sold many Israel bonds most of the Israel bonds that were sold at the time were bonds that were purchased by the U.S. Jewish community. And we'll see that the U.S. Jewish community and the U.S. government actually bailed Israel out of economic failure many, many times in the history that was to come. So Israel was established. Israel was a given fact. Between the 1950s and the 1980s, and we're going to talk in greater detail about that intervening period, but between the 1950s and the 1980s, really the industrial base was established. And if we look at these two pictures, this is Atta. This is a textile plant near Haifa. And this is the development of the national water carrier. So Israel's early leaders were socialists. And they, but well, socialists to varying degrees, either extreme socialists or moderate socialists. But Israel's ruling faction was a socialistic party, what would become the Labor Party. And they needed to provide employment for a growing population. So much of the industry in Israel was either government owned or government sponsored or government sanctioned. And essentially, the government became the country's largest employment agency. Now, we'll get to the point in just a minute where imports were strictly regulated. So we know what happens in regulated markets, that you have industry, but the industry is generally very inefficient because you don't have foreign competition. So you produce goods that are both bad and costly because there's no incentive to produce goods that are better and less costly. So that was Israel's industrial base. And Israel experienced a lot of economic growth in the 1950s and 1960s for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons was that there was continued immigration throughout those years. So by the end of the 1950s, there was nearly full employment and low inflation. 
So the economy was doing quite well. Uh, increased consumer spending, however, there wasn't increased economic productivity, so that upset the trade imbalance. This building, or these buildings over here, are fairly typical of the buildings that were built in the 1950s and 1960s, housing projects. Every country has their own housing projects. Well, this is Israel's version of the housing projects, and these housing projects were built to house the immigrants that continued to come to Israel in the 1950s and 1960s. And if people are employed, then there happens to be an economic boom. But again, Israel had this problem because the economy might have been doing well, apparently, but there weren't exports to sustain the economy, so it was really an illusion. And by 1996, unemployment doubled and emigration surpassed immigration. There are a lot of uh, <coughs> black humor, dark jokes about that period of time. And one of the popular jokes at the time was, well, the last one to leave, please turn off the lights. In other words, there's not going to be anybody left. If nobody's left in the country because emigration surpasses immigration, just make sure you turn off the lights. And there were a bunch of other jokes, but as they say, they're funnier in Hebrew. So, <coughs> wars are terrible. However, wars oftentimes provide economic benefits. And one of the economic benefits that arose from the, well, we'll get there in just a minute. Um, early after the establishment of the State of Israel, the French, for various reasons, were the primary arms supplier to Israel. And because of Algeria and various things that were going on in North Africa, Three days before the outbreak of the Six-Day War in 1967, Charles de Gaulle said, Oh, Israel, by the way, we're enacting an arms embargo, and we will no longer provide weapons to the state of Israel. Well, they provided them with very short notice, three days before the start of the Six-Day War. Now, of course, that was a terrible thing, but there were some positive things that resulted from it. Um, they sort of forced Israel into the arms of the Americans. Uh, that's a double entendre, but they forced them to the arms of the Americans quite literally, and Israel became largely reliant upon weapons that were exported from the United States. But another fringe benefit of the French embargo was that Israel was forced to develop its own domestic arms industry. And again, we'll get to this later on, but nowadays, for better or for worse, Israel's the world's eighth largest arms exporter. Now, it's interesting, you compare Israel to countries like Great Britain and the United States and China and Russia, the countries are much larger. Those countries have engaged in wars of much greater proportions. Again, for better or for worse, while well, it's a wonderful thing to the economy, you can judge the question from an ethical standpoint and say the exportation of arms is a terrible, unethical thing. Again, that's a debate. Is it, is it first per capita? Uh, I don't know, but I would assume far and away. I would assume far and away per capita, they are the largest uh, arms exporter to the world. Again, for better or for worse, and I want to avoid the uh, um, ethical baggage here. Um, one of the one of the principles that you'll see repeated again and again is adversity as opportunity. For anybody who engages in judo, for example. You know that when you engage in judo, you take your enemy's strength, and your and you take your opponent's strength, you take your opponent's uh, 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 take your opponent's uh, um, strength, you take his you take his uh, uh, inertia, and you use that to your benefit. Okay, so that's sort of converting adversity into opportunity. And everybody talks about converting adversity into opportunity, but again, those are just hollow words if you don't have the skill set or the capacity to convert this adversity into opportunity. And through institution building and universities and so forth, in many cases, Israel was able to successfully convert this adversity into opportunity. So the Six-Day War fortunately ended quickly, brought about a new wave of immigration from Western countries, Soviet Union, many Western Jews immigrated to Israel, and they brought with them an educated population with skills which would later be very, very beneficial to the economy. 1968, Israel ranked second in the world behind Japan 
in annual growth in exports. So those years, the Israeli economy was booming. By the way, this is a French mirage. There are French mirages in Israeli museums, but of course, the Israeli Air Force no longer flies the French mirage. So Israel's early efforts to liberalize the markets, in other words, to engage in free commerce, uh, unencumbered trade, unrestricted trade, came about not through political change in Israel, but through political change in what would become the European Union. In other words, <clears throat> Israel was still staunchly socialist. Their political leadership was still staunchly socialist. They believed in employing people. They believed in protecting domestic industry. They were not liberalizing their industries, but because there was a need for export, they said, okay, Europeans, because we want to engage in trade with you, we'll do whatever it is that you tell us to do. So some trade restrictions were replaced with tariff protections. In other words, at this point, it was no longer illegal to import blue jeans from abroad. It was just very expensive to import blue jeans from abroad. And again, if the taxes are high enough, the domestic industries are still largely protected. And what's important to note is that at this point in history, socialism was still the ideology that was promoted by the government. 1973, another war. This war was far more tragic than the Six Day War. And this war had great consequences not only on Israel, but this war had great consequences for the entire world. What were the consequences? So the consequences were as follows. The Arab neighboring countries surrounding Israel were armed by the Soviet Union. Israel entered this period of complacency after the Six Day War. And they said, we defeated our neighboring countries so resoundingly that they will never attack us again. 1973, sure enough, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, Israel was attacked. It was a surprise attack. It was a colossal intelligence failure on the part of the military, and many heads rolled because of it. But Israel was attacked. Israel begged the United States, please send us weapons, please send us weapons. And again, if you know your history, Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State at the time. Really fascinating stories. But when Israel was down and out, after days and weeks of pleading, the Americans said, okay, we will send arms. What was the problem? The OPEC countries, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, which were largely Arab countries, they said to the United States, if you dare export arms to Israel, we're going to punish you severely. You're going to punish us, the great United States. Well, what did they do? Sure enough, before the Yom Kippur War, in October of 1973, petroleum was priced at $3 a barrel. Again, in today's term, what's petroleum being traded at? 60, 50, 60 dollars a barrel, something like that. Well, nearly overnight, the price quadrupled. And once upon a time, Americans weren't really sensitive to the price of petroleum because the price of petroleum was so cheap. Americans drove large, inefficient cars, but nobody really cared that the cars were larger and efficient because fuel prices were so cheap. I remember, actually, as a small child, I remember as a small child, watching President Nixon on TV, wearing a sweater, getting up from his chair, walking over to the thermostat and turning the thermostat down, and he said, we'll have to get used to turning the thermostat down because petroleum prices were so high. So this is just a picture, closed due to shortage. There were petroleum shortages. Um, but one of the interesting things that resulted from it, not necessarily a good thing, many of us, well, I don't live in the United States, but many people in the United States drive Japanese cars. Why do people in the United States drive Japanese cars? People began to purchase Japanese cars several years later because Japanese cars were small and fuel efficient. And the United States car manufacturers, Ford and General Motors and Chrysler, just didn't produce small fuel efficient cars. So Japanese cars became very successful in the United States because Americans were looking for smaller fuel efficient cars that were not available and that really had a substantial impact on the U.S. economy, on Michigan, Detroit, all the suppliers, steel, and so forth. Really fascinating to see the impact, maybe tragic impact, maybe inevitable impact, of the Yom Kippur War in what were called the oil shocks on the world economy. In 1977, the unexpected 
an unprecedented happened, and there was a change in government. Menachem Begin was forever, since the establishment of the State of Israel, he was the opposition leader. The opposition leader, think in political terms nowadays, for 30 years, he was the leader of the opposition. That political party wouldn't get rid of him. For 30 years, he led the opposition. In 1977, the Likud, or what was to become the Likud, took over the political leadership of the State of Israel. And we think in terms of left politically and right politically. In Israel, when we say left and right politically, many people talk about the territories. What's the attitude toward settlement and the territories? But left and right politically, both in Israel and throughout the world, oftentimes means what is the role of government in society? And those people who tend to have rightist views, they think the role of the government should be minimized. They believe in free markets. They believe in free enterprise, free economy, minimal government intervention. And the left believes in, no, it's the role of government to regulate these things. It's the role of government to see that people are well off and so forth. So, <coughs> excuse me, when the right took over, there was a change in attitude, and all of a sudden, we believe in free enterprise. We believe in free economy. So that's what happened, and there was a change. Because I mentioned that Israel's leaders, since the establishment of the state, were socialists. All of a sudden, we had a political party that supported a free economy. Okay? But the economy wasn't yet ready for this free economy, and several things happened. There was very high inflation. There was very high inflation because all these industries were inefficient because they had been controlled by the government for 30 years and they didn't necessarily have profit motives. So you're reliant upon exports for money, yet you can't export because your plants aren't efficient and they don't produce goods that the world wants to buy. Yet you have free markets and nobody wants to buy these factories, so it creates this tremendous imbalance. And there was lots of inflation at the time. One of the ways to create window dressing, and artificially control the inflation is by changing the currency. And that was what they did. They changed 10 liras to one shekel. In other words, gee, if we change the name of the currency and we chop one zero off, then we're controlling the economy. They didn't control the economy. They didn't do anything. In fact, if we look at this graphic over here, this represents the price increases through September. September is the ninth month of the year. So if we look at the price of dental care, it increased by 346.5% in the nine months, first nine months in 1984. If we look at the cost of telephone service, it increased by 376%. I mean, you can imagine what these price increases do to the average simple Israeli. And this was just untenable. Something needed to change. I remember, as a matter of fact, once upon a time, they used to have menu boards on the sidewalk for restaurants, and they would write the prices in chalk because they would need to update the prices at least once a day, sometimes more than once a day. How, how widespread was it? Um, the, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I do. The use of dollars, people selling things by dollars instead of shekels. So, <coughs> dollars were illegal. It was illegal to hold dollar accounts, but there was a black market. Just like what happened in the Soviet Union, happened in Israel, and there was use of dollars, even though the use of dollars was illegal. In fact, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who would go on to become prime minister, he got himself into trouble because he was stationed in the United States as the U.S. ambassador to the United States, and his wife had a U.S. dollar account, which at the time was against the law, and he was forced to resign because of that. So in 1985, the Economic Stabilization Plan came about. And at first, I want to tell you a little bit about this. Um, that is Maimonides, and he was featured on the 1,000 shekel coin, January 1st, 1986. And I remember this quite well, and I'll tell you why I remember this quite well. How do you control inflation? Well, just chop three zeros off the currency. So 1,000 shekels overnight became one new shekel. Right? This is the old bill. Chop three zeros off. Add the word new to the shekel, and you've controlled inflation. Right? So I'll tell you a little story. It's going to take me a minute to tell you the story. But I was a young yeshiva student studying in Israel at the time. I was studying in religious studies, and uh, I was in charge of the charity fund. So what I would do is I would take the charity, collect it, and I would deposit it in our bank account. So again, 
1985 ends, January 1st, 1986, we've got this new currency. I would literally, literally take shopping bags full of money to the bank. And my first experience of taking these shopping bags full of money to the bank is, I would enter the bank and I'd say, I'd like to dump all this money into a counting machine. And they said to me, oh, we're not going to count the money for you. You count the money. Me? I'm the customer. They, said, they sent me to the back room of the bank. I dumped shopping bags full of money onto the tables. It took me literally hours to count the money. Literally, it took me hours to count the money. And then I tell the bank staff, okay, I reached some sum. The sum is whatever. And they write it down. They deposit it into the bank account. And I said, aren't you even going to count the money? They said, no. The money's worth so little anyway, you could say whatever you want and we'll believe you and we'll write down this sum. Well, my job became much easier on January 1st, 1986 because people became much less generous. You know, it's very easy to put coins in charity when they're not worth anything. But all of a sudden when coins are worth something, people become much less <laughs> generous with their charity. So the 1980s end and the 1990s come about. And I'm going to cut to the chase and I'll tell you that throughout history, every boom cycle is followed by a bust cycle. Very positive things happen to the economy in the 1990s, but negative things happen to the economy as well in the 1990s. What happened? Well, the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1989, 1990, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and over a period of time, about one million immigrants from the Soviet Union came to Israel. And as we've seen in some of the previous waves of immigration, many of those that came to Israel in 1989, 1991, 92, the early part of the 90s, they were very educated. They were doctors, they were scientists, they were mathematicians, they were engineers. And people like to talk about the startup nation. Now, these people might not necessarily have been entrepreneurial because they were raised in the Soviet system that didn't value free enterprise, but they did have the scientific and mathematical and engineering skills to provide the knowledge to those who would become the entrepreneurs. Another interesting thing happened. Anybody who studied Econ 101 knows about economies of scale. And what happened was, over this period of time, the population grew from 4.6 million to 6 million. And when the population grows, yet the fixed costs of maintaining industry and universities and infrastructure and roads, if those fixed costs remain constant, but there are more people working and more people paying taxes and more people contributing to the economy, the burden per person decreases. So people were happy because people were paying fewer taxes. In fact, at the time, mandatory military service was also decreased. Every male and female in Israel, high school graduate must serve the military. And because all of a sudden the population had grown, the mandatory military, military service was reduced in terms of duration. So there's a period of uh, euphoria because everybody was coming. But again, like every one of these cycles, suicide terror, world economic slowdown, brought about recession, terrible things would come. Again, boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust, as we see throughout the world, is present in Israel as well. So we've reached the new millennium, and the new millennium would bring good things and bad things. The new millennium brought about the second intifada, the uprising, suicide bombings, all kinds of terrible things. and also brought about, unrelated to Israel, the dot-com bust. If you learned a little bit about modern economic history having nothing to do with Israel, once upon a time, if you had a shoe store, and you would call your shoe store, shoestore.com, you would have investors throwing money at you because everybody thought that was the future of the world. Well, it turns out that .com, virtual business, online business is a wonderful thing, but not every business is suitable for online, and not every business that you move to online is successful. So many, many investors lost all their money, and that, of course, contributed to the worldwide economic downturn. One of the things that happened as a result of free enterprise and freer economy is that many people became very, very wealthy. But not everybody became very wealthy. And people would say, when I was a kid, we were poor. But because everybody was poor, we didn't know that we were poor. But what happened at the turn of the millennium 
was that there were poor and there were rich. And the poor people knew they were poor because they saw the rich people and they had nicer homes, nicer cars, nicer clothing, and everything like that. So what we see here is, again, bad practice. You can't read the fine print. I'll tell you what that's all about. What we're looking at there is the Gini coefficient. And again, anybody who studied economics, developmental economics, macroeconomics, they know that the Gini coefficient is a measure of distribution of wealth. In other words, the lower the coefficient, the more equitably wealth is distributed in the country. So people talk about Scandinavian countries where there are very small gaps between haves and have-nots. People like to speak about the United States, but there are more extreme cases of Mexico or South Africa where there are tremendous gaps between the haves and have-nots. So one of the things that happened with Israel's new economy is that lots of wealth was created, but that raised this very important ideological and philosophical question, and that is, do we want to maximize the country's wealth, or do we want to minimize the gaps between the haves and have-nots? In fact, that's a question that's asked all the time. In the United States, you don't have socialized medicine. Why? Well, go pay for your own medical care. Go work for somebody who's going to pay for medical care. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. It's an ideological, philosophical thing. But if you go live in other countries, Canada, Scandinavian countries, you pay much higher taxes, but the government provides you with many more services. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but Israel transitioned to the sort of free market, capitalistic country. The second decade, that's the decade that just ended several months ago. <coughs> so the second decade was entered as a result of this financial crisis or the subprime crisis. And fortunately, Israel was able to largely avoid this crisis because the banking industry in Israel, for better or for worse, this is probably a throwback to old socialism, the banking industry in Israel is a much more regulated industry. So it's much more regulated. There's much less competition among the banks. The banks engaged in much less risky practices. So Israel was largely saved. But again, some other things happened. There was a doctor's strike in Israel that lasted four and a half months. We talked about haves and have-nots. The Israeli population grows very rapidly through immigration and through natural population growth. But there are some things that don't grow very rapidly, like housing stock. In other words, it's very easy to bake more bread for a larger population. It's not very easy to create more housing stock for a growing population. So what happens if the population grows faster than the housing stock? Housing prices rise. So this is one of the social protests in Tel Aviv where for months people camped out in tents as a form of protest and they said, we want the government to look out for us so that we can afford housing. Young couples who would look to purchase homes or apartments of their own couldn't afford homes or apartments because housing prices had increased so much. What do you do? How do you deal with it? Well, some other changes, and now we're getting into the high-tech economy, we're getting into the startup nation economy. By 2016, Israel led the world in VC venture capital investments per capita. In other words, Nowadays, in the markets, it's very hard to make any money because interest rates are so low. Worldwide investors are looking to make money, and how do you make money? It's very risky, but the return may be very high if your gamble is a successful gamble. So we've got lots and lots and lots of foreign currency flowing into Israel, betting on entrepreneurs, betting on people engaging in startups being successful. So that, of course, contributes to the economy High growth rates, low unemployment, rising salaries, high credit rating, along with low productivity, wealth and equity, high poverty. So the economy is doing really, really well, but not everybody is benefiting from this economy that's doing really, really well. What do we do? Well, <clears throat> let's look at where we stand nowadays. This is a couple years old, but it's a pretty accurate depiction of the Israeli economy. This is a list of exports. That's a list of imports. Israel exports finished diamonds. Israel imports raw diamonds. Israel, once upon a time, the economy is based largely on the diamond polishing industry. And of course, India, which is a lower cost country, is able to polish diamonds more efficiently 
then Israel is able to polish diamonds. But fortunately, how do you get around the cost of labor? Well, you develop capital that's able to do it. So Israel has developed machinery that could polish diamonds more cheaply than lower paid Indian laborers. So this is just a, a big picture of what the Israeli economy looks like nowadays. For those of you who are going to Israel, you might be surprised. One of Israel's largest industries is the knowledge industry. We talk about startups and innovations and entrepreneurs and so forth, but a very large employer in Israel's economy is foreign companies that engage in not manufacturing in Israel, but research and development in Israel. Again, Apple does their manufacturing in China because it's inexpensive. But why might they do research and development in Israel? Well, if we look at all these companies, we're familiar with many, many of these companies. All of these companies do their research and development in Israel because in Israel they have the knowledge, they have the creativity, they have various skills that enable research and development to come up with ideas that may not be attainable elsewhere. So we'll talk about that in, uh, in uh, a couple slides. So what does Israel have to offer the world? Largely knowledge. R&D, we probably still export some wine, and we probably still export some oranges, but our economy is no longer reliant upon those things. Now, how is it that Israel is so successful in exporting knowledge? How is it that Israel is so successful in R&D? Well, take a look at this. Again, bad practice. You probably can't see it. So I'll translate this for you. What we're looking at is a diagram. This is from UNESCO. This is from the United Nations. If we look on the X, X axis, we look at R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product. In other words, the further to the right you are, the greater percentage of the country's economy is spent on research and development. And the Y axis is, I don't know what we call it, scientists or researchers per million inhabitants. So we look at all these developing countries, and these developing countries are so far away from the knowledge economy. We look at a country like China, that they're much more advanced than the other countries, but still they spend a very small percentage of their GDP on research and development. Well, why is that? Because in China, it's such a large, populous country, the government needs to see, see to it that everybody is employed. And they know that these people could be employed in manufacturing, these people may not necessarily be employable in the knowledge industry. But Israel, in order to survive, because we can't offer the world low price manufacturing, we're just not good at it, and our domestic economies aren't large enough, so Israel spends a lot and a lot of money on research and development. And you'll notice the only country in the world, which is fascinating, it's an entirely different discussion, but the only country that spends a greater percentage of its GDP on research and development is South Korea. And if you follow South Korea, it's a fascinating country that over a very short period of time evolved from being what we might call a primitive country to a world leader. Really, very, very interesting. So Israel is able to engage in attracting all these multinationals to Israel to engage in R&D because of all these capabilities and because of all of these researchers that are available. So what drives innovation? What drives innovation? I mentioned several times that I'm not a big lover of the word startup nation. I don't like that, but again, it's probably unavoidable. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Israel's entrepreneurship and I didn't mention startup nation in this talk. What drives innovation? They like to say that necessity is the mother of all invention. Maybe they say nowadays necessity is the parent of all innovation, but we don't create new things unless there's a need for these new things. But we have lots of needs. So does that mean that for every need we have, we come up with a new technology that addresses that need? Knowledge. Some of the needs we have can't be addressed because they violate scientific principles. People die every year of cancer and it's a terrible tragedy. Why isn't there a cure for cancer? Because the scientific knowledge doesn't yet exist to cure cancer. Well, how do we achieve this knowledge and these capabilities? Knowledge. Satisfying the need is possible and the knowledge to do so exists. Well, we're able to achieve this knowledge by investing in R&D, by developing academic institutions, by engaging in research. So again, we've got this perfect storm. Needs, we can address those needs because we have the knowledge to address those needs. Feasibility, what does feasibility mean? The knowledge can be applied in a feasible manner from economic and engineering perspectives. Again, Israel is a very small country. 
So if you spend a billion dollars developing a product, it might not be cost effective for Israel, which is a very small consumer market. But if Israeli products that are developed are already suitable for the world, then the world is the market, not the domestic market. There's a concept called born global. That's a concept I'll say for an entirely different talk. Finally, funds. I mentioned the inflow of uh, foreign investment. So again, Israel happens to be a world leader in attracting foreign investment. There exists financing skilled workers and other necessary resources to develop the technology. And here's the kicker, and that is an innovator who will take charge. I'll spend two or three minutes talking about the innovator who will take charge. Um, needs, finally, the innovator. Um, well, let's talk about that. Innovation, entrepreneurship, is very much a part of the ecosystem. It's very much a part of the culture. Every school, for school children, they have economic, they have entrepreneurship competitions. My two youngest kids who are high school students, over the summer they participate in this entrepreneurship competition. It's so much a part of the culture. Like in the United States, people might play baseball. Well, there they play soccer, but there they also engage in entrepreneurship. It's just part of the culture, and it's what you do. Even if you're not an entrepreneur, you are encouraged to be an entrepreneur. So everybody's either an entrepreneur or a sort of frustrated wannabe. <laughs> so we talked about needs. I mentioned earlier <coughs> in the talk that Israel is a net exporter of water, and Israel is a net exporter of agricultural products, and Israel is an exporter of defense goods. These are just some of the examples, and those are some of the industries that are very, very popular in Israel. I entitled this talk, From Oranges to Orcam. I don't have any special allegiance to the company Orcam, but I like the alliteration. Oranges, Orcam, start with the same syllable. So I said from oranges to Orcam. And if I already called the talk from oranges to Orcam, let me explain what Orcam is all about, or who the progenitor was of Orcam. There's a guy who was a professor at the Hebrew University by the name of Amnon Shashua, a physicist, and he developed artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence, and artificial vision, and for many years he worked on autonomous cars. He created a company called Mobile Eye, and he actually sold the company Mobile Eye to Intel for something like 11 or 12 billion dollars. So he's pretty well off, and he doesn't really need to work for a living, but he does. And after Mobile Eye, he came up with this venture, which again, it's there are for-profit motives, but there's also some kind of humanitarian <laughs> twist to it, and that is to provide artificial vision to people who are either blind or visually impaired. So blind or visually impaired people might wear this device on their glasses. The device on the glasses has an artificial eye, an artificial brain, and they have an earphone attached, and it'll actually read to them. This artificial vision can recognize different currency. This artificial vision can recognize faces. This artificial vision can read texts to them. So again, oranges to orange to orcam. Okay. What's next? I think I've run over time. So I will conclude momentarily. Turns out that I've had opportunity in the past to consult with governments of developing nations. And oftentimes representatives of governments of developing nations will say to me, we want to be just like Israel. We might be located somewhere in Eastern Europe. We might be located somewhere in Central Europe or Latin America. But we want to follow the Israeli model. And the Israeli model is so not relevant. Why is the Israeli model not relevant? There are many things we can learn. And there are many things that we can't learn. What can we not learn from Israel? We can't learn from Israel. You can't be like Israel. You can't overnight develop these R&D capabilities. You can't be like Israel because you might have a large country and Israel has a very small domestic market. You can't be like Israel because Israel's had lots of wars and those wars have fostered development. You don't want to engage in wars for the sake of developing products. Again, Israel's model of development is not a desirable, it's circumstance that led that model of development. Israel's population grows by leaps and bounds. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's circumstance, so the model may not be relevant to you. But what can be learned from Israel's model of development? Well, before I talk about what can or cannot be learned from Israel's model of development, I want to say one thing. From this talk, if we look at the micro level, 
we've seen boom bust, boom bust, boom bust, boom bust, boom bust, and that's no different from the other economy. But if we were to take a step back, take a look at this one. Imagine this. You're looking at a beautiful person from about an inch away with a magnifying glass. You don't see a beautiful person if you're looking at him or her with a magnifying glass from an inch away. You see blemishes. You see defects. You see flaws. The person isn't very beautiful if you're looking at this person from an inch away with a magnifying glass. So what I presented to you is pretty much looking at this beautiful person with a magnifying glass from an inch away. But if we're able to step back, right, and we're able to not look at this micro resolution, but a macro resolution, it's true, boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust, but the general trend is a phenomenal general trend in terms of economic development. So what can we learn? What are the relevant lessons? Transparency, strong central government, rule of law. Now, an Israeli might see these things and laugh, but it's really true that there's law, and there's central government, and there's law enforcement in Israel. And if you were to be some kind of developing nation in Africa, or some kind of developing nation in Central or Eastern Europe, or some kind of developing nation in Latin America, you said, we want to be just like Israel. Well, you can't be just like Israel if you have governments that constantly change, if you have tribalism, if you don't have allegiance to, the small central, to this strong central government. You need to build institutions. You can't just say, we want to engage in R&D, we want to engage in entrepreneurship. You can't do that. We spoke about how the institutions were established long before the state. You need health care, you need universities, you need government, you need roads. Without any of these things, you can't have an innovation-based economy. Free enterprise has to be rewarded. You need a curious culture. And this is probably the thing that's biggest challenge for many developing countries to copy, and that is people like laws. I love America. I love the United States. People in America are very disciplined, and that's why the United States works. But you know what? People in Israel are less disciplined. For better or for worse, people in Israel are less disciplined. They challenge the status quo. They question. A curious culture that seeks creative solutions to persistent problems and challenges the status quo. There's this joke. Why do Jews always answer questions with questions? What's the answer? Why not? So I'll tell you another very, very brief story, and I'll end momentarily. And that is, this really has nothing to do with Israel, but it has to do with curiosity and challenging the status quo. There's a story, and it's attributed to many people, but one of the people that it's attributed to is this physicist, an American physicist, 1940, by the name of Isidore Rabi, who won the Nobel Prize. And after winning the Nobel Prize, he was asked, what caused you to become such an outstanding scientist? And Isidore Rabi said, every day as a small child, I used to come home from school, and rather than my mother asking me, what did you learn in school today? She would say to me, did you ask any good questions in school today? And it's challenging. It's challenging the status quo. It's asking questions. It's challenging authority. Just because that's the way it's done doesn't mean that that's the way it should be continued to be done. We challenge. We question. We come up with creative solutions to persistent problems. Thank you very much. The, uh, the floor is open to questions, and in particular, anyone can ask, whether you're in the class or not. But for those in the class who, uh, who did some reading for today, if you want to apply that, if there's things that didn't get addressed that you want to clarify on, this is our resident expert. Now is the chance to get an answer. Others are welcome to jump in as well. Everybody has to ask for a question. Which immigration period had the biggest impact on Israel's economy? Oh, that's such a great question. That is such a great question. In terms of scale or scope, it's a very good question. I would say, <coughs> it's a great question, and historians are debating this one. I would say that the earlier waves of immigration prior to the 20th century established these villages and they established economic foundations of Israel. I would say that the fifth wave of immigration, which brought in lots of middle class educated Jews from Germany, had the most important impact on the establishing of the industry and the modern economy. And I would say that in terms of scale, the most recent immigration of Jews from the Soviet Union in the 1990s had the greatest impact in terms of sheer numbers. 
Great question. Uh, as far as Israel being a startup nation, um, I know that uh, an entrepreneurial culture is in many ways very positive. Um, but if a lot of the object of a startup is to sell it, doesn't that create a lot of issues? Yes, it does. And that's also a great question. Um, I was meeting with some of the professors here over lunch, and that was just one of the topics that we discussed. I do research with a colleague of mine in Germany, and uh, in many ways, Germany, modern Germany and modern Israel are mirror images of each other. And that is, in Israel you have this entrepreneurial culture, create a company from scratch, get to a certain size, sell it for a billion dollars, and then you're rich. Whereas in Germany, they've got all these mid-sized companies that are not very innovative. So in Israel, it's build up, sell. Whereas in Germany, it's maintain without the build up, or without the creativity. Um, look, Israel's a small country. And I mentioned Mobile Eye. Mobile Eye was this company created for autonomous cars. Maybe Intel, because it's this enormous world company, they could do better than small Israeli mobile eye. You look at Waze, which uh, one of the founders of Waze, the guy who lives a couple doors away from me, and Waze was a small Israeli startup. And in order for Waze to become a global company, they were purchased by Google. So maybe if you live in a small country with a small market, this, what they call it, the exit is just inevitable. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Maybe it's just inevitable because Israel is a small country. Other than a lot of um, people immigrating to Israel, what would you say or believe that their strongest and greatest economic benefit is compared to other countries? I think that, um, so I mentioned uh, adversity as an opportunity. I think just because of the very nature of the economy, Israel has been very good at converting adversity into opportunity. And the reason they were successful at converting adversity into opportunity is because the foundation exists, the knowledge exists, the culture exists, the infrastructure exists. And again, taking bad, making it good, because you have the skill set to do it, is probably the greatest opportunity. Everyone I talk to in Israel, and this just may be a cultural thing, so it may not be true, although I've seen some numbers that suggest there's something true, it talk about how incredibly shitty the education system is. Uh, primary and elementary, high school, I mean just how incredibly terrible it is. If you don't work extremely hard to get into the right school, you're probably going to be in a terrible school. So how do you drive the fact that its educational system sucks, but, you, but yet they're producing uh, this innovation and you say this is an entrepreneurial investment in R&D, or, or is everyone just complaining and actually it's not that bad? So that's e e everyone university complains that it's terrible. I mean, all my friends tell me so, that. So that's a really good question. And how do I answer that while standing on one foot, proverbially? Proverbially. OK. Um, the education system in Israel is both very good and very bad, depending on where you go to school. Um, we've been fortunate enough to send our kids to schools that are very good schools. And we were adamant about sending them to very good schools. And I think they get very good education. But beyond the education that they get, I think culture plays a very important role. There's what's called PISA, and PISA is this sort of international standard for comparing levels of education in different countries. And the performance of Israeli schools, when you compare them to other countries, is always notoriously poor. And you say, well, how do you explain Israel's success as the startup nation and innovation and so forth. How do you explain it if the schooling is so poor and people get such bad education and people graduate without very good English skills or math skills? How is it that you have this, this phenomenon and you compare them to countries like Singapore or China or various other countries, <coughs> excuse me, where the educational systems may be outstanding and they prepare graduates with outstanding math skills and STEM skills and what have you. It may very well be that has more to do with the culture of curiosity and questioning than it has to do with the math skills that you learn or the English skills. Those are all very important. I don't mean to, to, to minimize the importance of those things, but it may just be that if you have math skills, but you don't have a culture of inquisitiveness, you don't have a culture of challenging the status quo, those math skills aren't going to take you very far. You might be a very good employee, 
but you're certainly not going to, you know, make some kind of, of, of headway technologically or, or change the world. Would you say uh, the military as a mandatory service helps people like later on in the professional? Definitely yes, and that's something that I've researched, and again, if we had 10 hours to discuss it, I'd talk about the research that I've done. The military definitely plays a role. Um, what is it about the military that plays the role? Is it skills that people get? Is it leadership skills? Is it the knowledge that they get? Um, in my research, I've looked at the entrepreneurship of people who are in combat units versus people who are intelligence units. We've discovered all kinds of interesting stuff. Absolutely. The mechanism, how it works, that's under question. But absolutely, the military plays a role in terms of fostering entrepreneurship. Absolutely. So bouncing off the education system, when you say entrepreneurial culture, is that kind of reflected in the education system? Like, are there certain, like, how is that reflected in that? Um, if it even is reflected? So, so, um, it's both formally and informally. In other words, every school has entrepreneurship competitions. Every school fosters entrepreneurship. Every school has outside speakers come to speak to the school children about entrepreneurship and creatively solving problems. There was this program that used to be very popular in school called uh, Galileo, where the students would learn how Galileo creatively solved problems and came up with new technologies. But I think it has more to do with not what goes on in school, but just this ambient culture of challenging, questioning, so forth. I was say, too, the text mentioned something about um, as a denomination, the Jewish things go down from the ultra Orthodox, they only receive like 75% or less of the core curriculum, such as math and science. And I was going to ask, do these students, do people go out of Israel and come back, go out of Israel to a university, gain the knowledge for R&D, and then come back to Israel? Or do they just have to fight to get accepted in a <coughs> prestigious school? Um, so that, that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's a very good question. Um, so I'm affiliated with the Jerusalem College of Technology. The Jerusalem College of Technology is a religious school. And one of the things we try and do is we offer um, an academic, what would you call it, a preparatory program for the ultra-Orthodox. Like a bridge so, program. I'm sorry? Like a bridge program. Like a bridge program. Sort of like a GED type program. In other words, let's say you've had, you're 25 years old and you have only a fourth grade secular education. So you're an adult, but yet your math skills are not sufficient for you to get into college, and your uh, scientific knowledge is not sufficient. So we have this sort of year-long program. Again, it's not unique to us, but to help um, many people who have been deprived for whatever ideological reasons, to help them uh, integrate into higher education. We've been successful. It's a big challenge. Um, um, but one of the greatest challenges that the country has is integrating, um, how do we put it, disenfranchised populations into the labor force, whether it be ultra-Orthodox men who engage primarily in religious studies, or whether it be Arab women because of their particular culture, they don't generally leave the home. Those are the two populations. It's really interesting because they're also mirror images of each other. So Arab women and ultra-Orthodox men, one of Israel's biggest challenges is to engage them in the workforce. And how do you engage them in the workforce? Well, providing them with higher education. So that's a challenge that the country is facing. And you know, we at the Jerusalem College of Technology are doing our small part, but it's a big challenge. And I think the leadership of those two different communities, both the ultra-Orthodox community and the Arab uh, population, I think the leadership has to somehow or other change the culture to encourage those things. When, when these growing men and women are being deprived of their like, math and science skills, this is like, they only like 25 and have a fourth grade math skill, when they're in their like, schooling and educational years, are they just, are they learning about religion dominantly? Is that what's taken over? Does so they among, about when they should learn about math and science? Are they actually uh, about Among, I mean, again, religion? this is really interesting stuff, but it's not particularly relevant to the talk, but among the ultra-Orthodox population, there's this belief that men are supposed to engage in full-time religious study, and the women go out to work to support their families so their husbands can sit and study in religious institutions. I mean, again, there's no historical precedent for that. It's never been that way in history, but it's just sort of some 
anomaly that developed in Israel. Um, so again, how do we put it? Again, in the primary grades, they learn these skills because they're studying religious texts. They're very good at reading, writing, analyzing, and their reading comprehension skills are very good, probably far above the national average. But they don't have the skills that enable Reading them. comprehension, not writing. Reading comprehension. Right. Again, this is a topic, this is a discussion that you and I can have, but um, look, it's, it's a big challenge. These people are not, neither the Arab women nor the ultra-Orthodox men, they're not illiterate. They're just uneducated in terms of what one would expect somebody entering the workforce, uh, the skills that they would expect them to have. Yeah. Um, so, based on the reading that we had before this class, I think it said that about 50% of ultra-Orthodox are not in the workforce. I don't remember the number for Arabs, but do you think that has had an effect on the Israeli economy? I think it's had a terrible effect on the Israeli economy. It absolutely has had a terrible effect on the Israeli economy. Um, again, people who work are productive and they're constructive and they contribute to the economy. And people who don't work um, uh, are beneficiaries of the social welfare service. You know, the more people you have contributing to the economy, the better off the economy is. The more people you have benefiting from the social services that the economy has to offer, the worse off the economy is. I mean, it's, it's simple math, right? It's not a good thing. Some people could say, well, religiously, it's a wonderful thing. And some people could say, ideologically, it's a wonderful thing. But certainly from an economic standpoint, it's a terrible thing. So going off that, saying that it's terrible, and there's so much, there are, there are so many like people now, because their population keeps growing, that are not working, do you think that Israel would like ever implement something that would start forcing these people to work? Or like I, that's a very good question. Again, you ask good questions. Um, uh, yes, I think so. And I'll tell you why. Once upon a time, within their community, they said, we can get away without working because we're, we constitute a small percentage of the population. But they've either reached a critical mass or they will reach a critical mass at some point in the near future because their natural growth rate is much higher and they will no longer be able to sustain that model where they don't get an education but they're beneficiaries of social welfare. They realize that. And the leadership of those communities sort of has been like, we realize we've got a problem but we don't want to expose our followers to the modern world because once they get a secular education, they're not going to be like we want them to be. So they're grappling with these problems right now and inevitably, inevitably things will change. Is it going to happen tomorrow or a month from now or five years from now? It'll change and it'll change in the very near future because it's just not a sustainable model. So since, um, since, all the, since the population is divided into certain denominations so heavily, um, something, you're right, something would definitely have to change, but um, if that were to happen, aren't, aren't you dealing with like the larger a section of the population gets, the less immersed they are in that entrepreneurial culture? So <coughs> you're dealing with people that are going to, by definition, have a harder time you know, integrating into that the larger the population gets because they're being more... I, that's, that's, right? that's also a very good question. Um, I think that, I'd call it the general population and the ultra-Orthodox population. I mean, I, I'm a religious observant person, but I integrate very well into Western modern society, right? So call them, say, the ultra-Orthodox and the rest of society. I think as the ultra-Orthodox become a larger and larger percentage of the population, I think the general population becomes more sensitive to their needs. You know, so the workplace is more, I don't know, in the U.S. you might call it multicultural. You know, it's more receptive of different people, people who might eat different food, people who might take off time in the middle of the day to pray, people who might engage in practices that the regular society might say, well, that's weird. But because they're a larger segment of the population, the general population is more exposed to them. And I think positive things are, are, are coming of it because, again, if you're exposed to different populations, you're more sensitive. It's inevitable, and I think it's probably a positive thing. I don't know how the taxes are there in, in, in Israel, or how it works, or what they are, but does the um, general population not get us very upset or yes, they very, do. get very unfair that the ultra Orthodox don't do anything with the army? Absolutely. Don't, they, so they don't it's in labor it's a constant, constant source of friction. But our, 
what, seem like higher, you know, I don't know. So look, that's not the right word, but I saw, it's not very like, be upsetting or very unfair. So if you've learned about how government in Israel works. That's next week. So I'll give you a promo. I'll give you a, a little preview. Um, so you have the Knesset, which is sort of like the Congress in the United States. There are 120 seats. And in order to form a government and become prime minister, you need to form a coalition of at least 61. That's the majority of the 120 seats. And it's never happened in history that a single party had 61 seats to rule the country. So in order to get smaller parties to form a coalition to run the country, you're beholden to what they would call in the US special interest groups. You know, so let's say you're a small party and you're a green environmental support group. I want you, I'm the big party. I want you to support me, so I'll give you several billion dollars a year to support your special interest group. And I'll give you several billion dollars a year to support your special interest groups. So one of the ways that the ruling party is able to rule is by buying off the smaller special interest groups. Now, one of these special interest groups happens to be the ultra-Orthodox, right? So again, this whole phenomenon of ultra-Orthodox men sitting and studying all day, it only came about because of the political system in Israel. In other words, we're a small ultra-Orthodox party. You need us in your coalition. Give us money to fund our men who are going to sit and study religious texts, and we'll support you whatever you want in the government. Um, so yes, the general population is very upset about it, but the reality of the way the system works is that the leading parties are oftentimes beholden to these smaller special interest parties, the ultra-Orthodox among them. So it's, it's a problem, and I don't think the problem is ever going to change unless the system of government changes, and that's not likely. Okay, I have one more question, and it's kind of back from the beginning of the presentation. And it was when um, you were saying how um, they thought that Israel wasn't going to be able to hold more than one million people. And I'm just curious as to why they thought that. Because um, the water resources and the arable land that could be used for agriculture is very, very limited. And if you would go back to 1939, and again, if we were solely reliant upon the water sources of then, and solely reliant upon the agricultural land of then, you'd have mass starvation, right? But the water that we drink in Israel is desalinated seawater. The water that they use in Israel for agriculture is recycled sewage water. A, a, a drop of water doesn't go to waste. You know, you flush your toilet, that water goes to some sewage treatment plant, and that water gets recycled for agricultural purposes, right? So if you're either recycling water or you're desalinating seawater, essentially you've got an unlimited supply, right? So it's true that once upon a time, you talk about arable land, um, in many countries they talk about this phenomenon of desertification, where agricultural land is becoming desert. In Israel, you actually have this opposite phenomenon where 60% of Israel is the Negev Desert. And essentially, the Negev Desert is becoming a little bit smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Why is that? Because agriculture is creeping its way down from north to south, and areas that were once upon a time desert are now agricultural. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a good thing because it's necessary to support the people. Some would claim that that violates the natural tendencies of the land because deserts are naturally occurring phenomena. But uh, again, because we're more efficient with agriculture, more efficient with the use of water, the land is able to support 15 million people. And uh, again, recently they just developed uh, uh, offshore sources of natural gas. So Israel has become, in the last three months, a net exporter of energy. Um, Israel supplies natural gas to Jordan and Egypt, and they're now building a pipeline to mainland Europe. Um, so, things change. Can we talk for just a second about the Jews who are not, who are in the army? I, I'm in no hurry to go anywhere. You know, as long, I, I just want to ask you, no, you know, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, there weren't that many Haredi, ultra-Orthodox, they're their own thing. The Arab Israelis were under military rule in the Galilee and elsewhere. The Jews were the Ashkenazim and the Mizrahi Jews, the Arab Jews. And as the class knows, there was massive economic disparity. 
the Israel Arab Jews were the underclass, they were the janitors, and they, had, they were earning way less than Ashkenazi and Marho. They, was, they were blocked and pouted. Part of the revolution in 1977, which you'll learn about next week, is that the Mizrahi Jews, the Arab Jews, are finally brought into government. In this new high-tech economy, not just high-tech, in the new high economy, the high-paying economy of Israel, is there still a massive disparity between Ashkenazi Jews and Arab Jews? There's clearly disparity between Jews and Arabs, but between, and obviously the ultra-Orthodox is their own story, but between Mizrahi Jew, Arab Jews and, and Ashkenazi Jews, is there a wealth disparity in this wonderful new wealth being created? It's a very good question. Um, and researchers grapple with that question, um, and the answer is no, with a caveat. Let me explain. Um, disparities uh, among Israeli Jews. Again, the Arabs are a separate population, we'll forget about that for a minute. But among Israeli Jews, disparities are more along um, urban and periphery, geographic periphery, rather than you know, Ashkenazi versus not Ashkenazi. In Israel, over the last 50, 30, 40 years maybe, there's been a lot of intermarriage within the Jewish population among the different subgroups of Jews, whether they be Eastern European or North African or Middle Eastern or whatever, there's been a lot of intermarriage among them. And if you speak to Israelis, you know, say, where do your parents or your grandparents come from? Well, my father's family comes from Poland and my mother's family comes from Iraq. You know, so you've got all these, and, and finding, it's not a nice word, quote unquote, pure bloods nowadays is not as common as was the case once upon a time. So as ethnic lines blur, this sort of ethnic, uh, um, what do you call it? Sort of ethnic uh, uh, disparities uh, decline. What is the case, and it persists, is that whether you're an Ashkenazi Jew or a Mizrahi Jew, if you live in Tel Aviv, you have access to better education, whereas whether you're an Ashkenazi Jew or a Mizrahi Jew, if you live in a development town in the Negev, then you have less access to education. So again, it's much less along ethnic lines nowadays and much more along geographic lines nowadays. You have less access to healthcare, education, transportation, wealth, job opportunities. I would suggest the Shas party is going to be in decline if they don't have a population to drop on. The Shas is the party of the, of the, it started as the party of ethnic Arab Jews, but became the party of the ultra-Orthodox Arab Jews as opposed to Degel Torah, which is the party of the ultra-Orthodox Ashkenazi Jews. But if these populations are being mixed, then how are the parties so distinct still? Which they are very distinct. Um, they appeal to a certain class. How do we put it? Um, there are people who have built their careers on um, ethnic, how do we put it, on ethnic downtroddenness. Whether or not this ethnic downtroddenness persists to this day doesn't really matter. There are people who, percept, who perpetuate this myth, and there are such people throughout the world, but there are some people who have built their careers on perpetuating this myth of, my people are the underclass, I'm going to rally the forces, and I'm going to become a leader. You know, it doesn't matter where you are. This exists throughout the world. Um, I think that the Shas party is perpetuating a myth that doesn't exist. But they are saying, we will instill this pride in you. The Ashkenazi establishment has, 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 uh, has uh, uh, beat us down. Not true. Maybe historically that was the case. It's certainly not the case anymore. Thanks. Um, so kibbutzim, uh, the ones, are they all privatized now in Israel? It's a very good question. Um, no. There are probably three main uh, kibbutz movements in Israel. Um, it, again, there are two secular kibbutz movements, and the lines break down upon how staunchly communist they were once upon a time. They're not communistic anymore, but you know, some were more communistic and some were less communistic. But did you support Stalin or did you oppose Stalin? And then there's a much smaller uh, kibbutz movement that is the religious kibbutz movement. Many of the religious kibbutzim to this day are still collective in the sense of shared dining, shared laundry. None of them have children's homes like they did. My wife 
grew up on a kibbutz, and she grew up in a children's home. You know, think of raising chickens. You know, you separate children from their parents, and you put them in a dormitory from infancy, and they grow up with other children. Why? Because ideologically, the children belong to the kibbutz and not to the parents. So fortunately, that doesn't exist anymore. Um, but the, the religious kibbutzim are still collective in the sense of shared wealth, shared dining. I'll give you an example. I have a cousin who is a very successful businessman on a kibbutz. What does that mean, very successful businessman? He has grown the kibbutz factory to a world proportions. He has established several manufacturing facilities for this kibbutz in Europe and elsewhere in the world. And he personally brings into the kibbutz millions and millions and millions of dollars a year. However, he gets a small stipend for the kibbutz. He does not become wealthy. He doesn't own a car. The kibbutz owns a car. He's entitled to use it periodically. He doesn't have a washing machine. The kibbutz washes his clothes. So, on the religious kibbutzim, they still believe in this stuff, but they're certainly not communistic. No children's houses like that once upon a time. No, we, we went to Chatzirot. It was the one that owns the, 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 owned the droplets. Chatzirot? Near Beershev? Yeah, near Beershev. We went there last year and hoped that we were going to go there this year. I think we're going to go there this year. Yeah. Maybe not, maybe not the, the, the seed thing, but the, the droplets. They just sold their company for like, was it $2 billion? A lot. It was billions of dollars. And they had 400 members. So you can't join the kibbutz anymore because everyone wants to join it, right? You can't join the kibbutz. They have 400 members. And they were still living. I mean, it was very pleasant. It was beautiful bungalows but like in a common dining room. It was like a nice upper middle class camp dining room, but it was still like a camp dining room. So and, I, and I said to them, you're a kibbutz. What the hell are you going to do with $2 billion? And the guy looks at me and says, it's a real problem. We don't know what to do with the money. And they, they, they can't, they're socialists. They can't. So, I, so I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple examples. So I asked, I asked my wife's, I asked my wife's, my, my in-laws, my wife's parents, um, on the kibbutz where my wife grew up, they had a business, and the business was sold, and the kibbutz made a lot of money. And I said to my father-in-law, I said, what are you do with all this money? He said, oh, we're going to pay off part of our debt. Because when the Labor Party was in power, the kibbutz, the kibbutz established, they were not economically viable. So they had debts, and the government would pay off their debts. They had more debts, the government would pay off their debts. But when the Likud came to power, they accrued more debt, and more debt, and more debt, and more debt. So the kibbutz sold off a factory, and oh, we'll cover part of our debt, but we're going to be in debt forever. So that's, that's one example. Another example is, I live in Jerusalem in a neighborhood called Arnona, sort of the southeastern edge of the city, and there's a kibbutz just beyond the municipal borders called Ramat Lachel, if you're familiar. And Ramat Rachel became very successful. How did they become successful? Because they had cherry orchards. Behind my house, I used to have cherry orchards as far as the eye could see. The kibbutz sold off their agricultural land, and it was so beautiful. And we used to go for hikes in the cherry orchards. I loved it. I loved the smell. I loved the blossom. One Friday morning, I wake up at 6 AM, and I hear this buzz of chainsaws. And there was a row of 30 men walking together with their chainsaws like this, chopping down all the trees. Anyway, what was this beautiful cherry orchard, for as far as the eye could see, is becoming, right now as we speak, 1,800 housing units and schools and shopping centers and this and that. So the kibbutz became very wealthy by selling off, selling off their agricultural land that they didn't really own. That's besides the point. South and west of Arnona. <laughs> so, to the east, to the east of Arnona. Well, the kibbutz is to the south of Arnona. But the question is, so what does the kibbutz do with millions of dollars if they believe in... I don't know, collective poverty, whatever it is. So everybody added a story to their home. In other words, they all lived in these one small, one-story bungalows. They said, we are allowing everybody to double the size of their home by adding another story. So they all added a second story to their homes. I, I thought another quick story. So I have, I have family, a family that lives on kibbutz, uh, different kibbutz. Anyway, they got married, and a wealthy relative from the United States this is 1982 or so. So a wealthy relative from the United States bought them a color television. But at the time, the kibbutz only had an allotment for black and white televisions for every family. But they got this color television from wealthy American relatives as a wedding present. So what are they supposed to do? And this is an honest-to-goodness story. They would watch their TV, but the kibbutz required them 
to set to black and white. And every night, every night, Inspector would look through their window to see if they are indeed watching television, color television, on a black and white setting, because it wouldn't be fair if they were to watch color television and other people only had black and white. But that's, that's, that's ancient history. That's ancient history. Are you allowed to, if you want to, are you allowed to separate from these, get, get out of your kibbutz, or is that... Well, there's no slaves, but you can't take, you don't take the money with you. You can't take, you, you, you don't like, own shares. I was, I was kind of thinking of the cases in like, your, your brother who's, who's reigning in millions of dollars for their... His, oh, it's a cousin of mine. But my brother would like to bring millions of dollars. He can't <laughs> separate and... Uh, oh, yeah, sure he can. Of course he can. But keep doing the, keep whatever, he, keep doing what he's doing to... Look, make there, there are people, there are people who live on kibbutz who work outside of kibbutz. You know, doctors, professors, uh, whatever, engineers. People don't work in the kibbutz factory or the kibbutz agriculture, but rather than the salary being deposited in their own bank account, the salary is deposited in the kibbutz bank account, so it doesn't matter how much they're making, they get whatever stipend the kibbutz allows them. I, again, these are on the kibbutz, the kibbutzim that are still socialized. Many, most of the kibbutzim are now privatized, so it's an entirely different story. But among the few remaining kibbutzim that are still socialized, doesn't matter how much you make, um, what do they say in communism? Each according to his abilities and each according to his needs. Just Another, in the Bible. Who said that? God said it in the Bible. God said it in the Bible? Of course. We said we read it, we read it last Saturday, and if you weren't sure, you would have heard it. it all the mana came, everyone according to the smaller had more, less, and the bigger had more. And then later, when they divided up the land, they said the bigger tribes would take more, right. the smaller tribes would take less. But one, one of the... One I'm, just, of I'm, the just, I'm just saying, you know... I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not trying Marx, to, I'm I think, trying to I mean, prosthetize here, but I am saying it is in the Bible. I think Karl Marx might have paraphrased the Bible <laughs> saying that. So again, it doesn't matter how much you make, um, you get out what the kibbutz allows you to have. But again, the kibbutzim are such a small percentage of the overall population. Kibbutzim were never more than 2 to 3% of the population, and now they're, they're much less than that. It's from uh, like the first of the oath, it was still only 2 or 3% of the nation. Uh, no, I mean, if you saw back one of the early slides, it was a much larger percentage of the population. But as the successive wave of waves of immigrants came, you know, smaller percentage uh, uh, established kibbutzim. Right? You know, there are modern kibbutzim, but most of the kibbutzim that were established were established in the pre-state mm -hmm. era. Okay. Thank you so much. My Thank pleasure. You. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.